peace to you from our Heavenly Father, through Jesus, his Son. Amen. The word of God for us to consider is from the first lesson taken from Acts chapter 11. There we were told the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This is God's word. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, dear fellow Christians. When somebody calls you a Christian, do you take it as a compliment or as an insult? When the Antioch believers were first called Christians, it's very likely they weren't being complimented. Some say that it was simply a legal term that this group had organized and it would be like an incorporation. Now you have to give it a title and so they picked the title Christians, and I think that's maybe putting a pretty positive spin on what really happened. Most of the time, the new believers were not accepted because this was a new religion. It was different from other religions. It was kind of strange religion. It centered on a carpenter's son who had been convicted of a crime by his government, a crime so heinous that it was worthy of death by crucifixion. Not exactly the makings of a superhero, not exactly the, the details of a success story. And now there were people who were saying that you had to hold to that person if you ever expected to live in heaven. You had to believe that Jesus was the Christ. And say, oh, you're one of those Christians. I think over the years, the perception of that term Christian has changed. People have realized that Christians, for the most part, are peace-loving people. They're kind and compassionate. They would rather see good done in the world than evil. They promote things that are beneficial, not wicked and harmful. And Christians are, for the most part, viewed as a, a complementary group of people, someone that they're okay. You don't have to worry about them. Now, I know that's not true all the time, but for the most part, if you're called a Christian today, I think it's a compliment. But how do we wear that title, Christian? First of all, we need to remember that we are Christians not by choice. We didn't decide that this was the best religion to follow. We didn't decide that Jesus was the Christ. We were called to be Christians, called by the power of the gospel, the love of God, and the working of the Holy Spirit. It is a blessing and privilege that we can call ourselves Christian. So how do we wear that title? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. That's the, the question that really arises from these words as this group of believers in Christ began to spread around the world. How did people view them, and, and what were they showing and telling people that helped to shape the opinion of people about that word Christian? How do we wear the title Christian? Well, first of all, we wear the title by sharing Christ. We do that through sharing the message. And then we wear that title by encouraging other believers to remain strong in faith. Jesus had died, he rose, he went to heaven. There was excitement in the Christian community about it, and so the devil realized he'd better do something and do it quick. And so he turned people against these new Christians, these new followers of Christ, and he began to persecute them with, first of all, being ostracized from their communities. Secondly, many were arrested, and now they were even being put to death as we hear from the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. It seemed the devil was trying to eradicate the world of these Christians and to erase that term from all of history. And he was working so hard to do that because he knew that Christians were on the right path and that by following Christ, they would go to heaven and he would lose them for his kingdom in hell. He began to step up his attacks on the Christian world and went so far as to murder Stephen. He's the first recorded martyr that we have in Scripture. There may have been others. But what was it that Stephen did that so angered these people? He was telling them about Jesus. He was wearing the title of Christian proudly. 
And we're told in Acts chapter 7, verses 57 and 8, that they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. And Stephen died with a prayer on his lips. A prayer of thanksgiving to God for calling him to be a Christian. A title he wore so proudly that he wore it to his death. And then we are told that the attacks on the Christians began to escalate. Chapter 8, verse 1 of Acts, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. Things weren't looking good for this fledgling religion, this small group of people that were trying to grow and share their message of salvation. The devil seemed to have a perfect plan in place so that he could, one by one, eliminate these Christians and slowly do away with that group of believers who were bound for heaven. But as Paul would later write to the Romans in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. The people that believed in him no longer were able to stay in their homes in Jerusalem and Galilee. The Roman government was now supporting the eradication of Christians, declaring it an illegal religion. And the people then had to scatter for safety to save their lives. And so they picked up and they moved and they went to different towns and villages, but the Lord was at work. We're told now those who had been scattered by this persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus, Cyrene, and Cyrene began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Opportunities to witness about Jesus seem to pop up at the least likely times and under the least likely circumstances. Here were some people who were run out of their homes, run out of their towns, run out of their villages. They had to flee to other towns and even other countries. And it seemed like this was not a victory for the Christian church, that nucleus that was growing in Jerusalem was scattered. But as they began to settle in their new homes, they met the neighbors. They met the owner of the marketplace. They met the tradesmen. And they began to talk to them. They began to explain, first of all, to other Jews, feeling that it, it was safe to talk to people with a similar background, telling them that they were believers in Jesus and that they had been persecuted in Jerusalem and Galilee and they had to flee and now here we are. And then others began to speak to the Greeks also as they felt safe and they felt strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. And one by one, their neighbors and the people in the market and the people that they did their business with began to listen. The hand of the Lord was with them, and the church actually grew in number because of these Christians and how proud they were to be Christians. Picture them sitting in the morning, having a cup of coffee. Didn't have a Starbucks back then, but somebody across the table. Well, good morning. What brings you here today? I don't remember seeing your face. Well, it's kind of a long story, but I'll be happy to tell you if you have a few moments. Who would have thought that somebody driven from their home, having to establish a new life in a new place, having a cup of coffee could become a missionary for God? Or maybe sitting on the front porch in the cool of the evening and the neighbors pass by and say, hey, we noticed you moved in recently. Where'd you come from? And the whole thing starts over again. Who would have thought that these people were a part of God's plan to grow the church. We don't know all of their names. We're not given any names. We're simply told that these Christians, people proud of their faith, proud of their Savior, took that with them wherever they went. And as they shared that message, God worked through it to bring others to be Christians. So we ask ourselves then, what are the opportunities that God has given to me? I don't think that there's any Christian persecution in our near future that's going to drive us away from Raleigh and Cary and our homes in North Carolina or Michigan or wherever it may be that we're going to have to find new places to live, but maybe our jobs will. 
Maybe as we retire, we decide we're going to go live somewhere else. Maybe on a vacation, we're in a Starbucks having coffee and someone sits next to us. You know, if you open your eyes, I think you'd be surprised at how many opportunities you see that you have each day in your life to maybe not directly engage someone in a, are you a Christian conversation, but, but to do something kind as Christians would do to improve the perception of what a Christian is and build a bridge that perhaps will lead to that conversation. I think there are many opportunities out there that, that we just don't notice because we're not really looking for them. And maybe it's even the opposite. The devil works in our hearts, kind of makes us afraid to talk about religion because it's not always a pleasant topic in everyone's life. And, and so maybe we try to skirt the conversation a little bit. You sit down next to someone and they ask you, you know, who you are, what you're doing there. Maybe you're on a, a trip, on a bus, or whatever it might be. And, oh, hi, where are you going? I don't think we initially think, how can I turn this conversation to a talk about religion? People ask us what church we go to. We'll tell them what church we go to. But do we try to take the next step and tell them why we go to that church? What that church is founded on? Christ. But if we open our eyes, we'll, we'll realize that it doesn't take a persecution to give us an opportunity. There are all kinds of opportunities in our own lives to do what these people did, and that was to share Christ with their neighbors. And as we do that, we have a promise from God. My word will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God used some of these people who had been scattered by the persecution to reach other people who reached other people who reached other people. And there are hundreds and thousands of people who will be in heaven because somebody talked about Jesus and God's word did what God sent it to do. And those are the opportunities that we have too as a congregation and as individuals to talk about Jesus. That's going to be the main focus of our ministry, whether it be in a Sunday service or in our individual lives. We're going to tell people about Jesus. And as we do so, the Lord is going to use our message to lead people to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit can then convince them that Jesus is the Christ. And more Christians will be made. More people will be brought to faith. And that's reason to rejoice. The Lord is saving another soul for eternity in heaven. More Christians are being made, but that's also reason for caution because the devil knows he lost another soul for his kingdom. And the devil is never going to give up in trying to regain those souls, to tear Christians away from their Savior, and to bring them back into his control. And so all of us, because we wear the title Christian proudly, are under attack. God saw that that was happening in Antioch, perhaps by the insult of the word as it was used then, but also by the ongoing persecutions of Christians around the world. And so God surrounded those Christians with other Christians and with leaders in the church to preserve and protect their faith and to encourage them. The wisdom of the Lord was demonstrated in the growing Christian church in Antioch. Luke wrote, News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. We first meet Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement. Some churches have Barnabas societies, which are groups that are used to do things for their church, service projects and other things. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, first comes to us through Acts chapter 4 when he sells a piece of property that he owns and he donated the money to the church. And he wore that title Christian proudly and he, he made things like that just an everyday part of his life so that he was called a good man. That doesn't mean he was slowly working his way up to heaven because of his good deeds, but he was a good man in the eyes of those around him and in the eyes of God because of his desire to serve the Lord and walk in his ways. 
And the church council in Jerusalem recognized that, hey, this church in Antioch is growing, and they're being persecuted, and they need a leader. So they sent this good man, Barnabas, to Antioch to become their pastor. In Antioch, Paul, or Barnabas sat down with the members, and he, he saw how many new members were coming in because the church just couldn't stop talking about Jesus, and all the people were telling their friends, and Jews and Greeks and people from all over were coming to faith, and Barnabas said, I need help. So he went to Tarsus to find this man named Saul. Well, you guys remember who Saul was, right? The leader of the persecution against the Christians until the Lord called him to be a missionary. Obviously, it was going to be difficult for him to minister in Israel where he had been persecuting people. His reputation was still out there. So the Lord called him away into the wilderness for three years where Jesus personally trained him in ministry. And then Saul went back home to Tarsus and, and he was waiting for his call into the ministry. He was waiting to be assigned by God. And Barnabas comes and says, I need help in Antioch. And we're told that for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. In the years to come, Barnabas and Saul became a great missionary team, and the Lord used them to call many, many people to faith through that message of salvation. And their names are simply added to a growing list of names that Scripture shares with us that God used to carry out his plan and to spread his message. Names like Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and Peter and James and John and then you can add the names of your pastors and Sunday school teachers, your moms and dads, your friends who also have shared that word. Proud to be a Christian, we want to protect who we are because we know we're under the attacks of the devil and God has put people in our lives to encourage us and to give us the strength to live in a world where persecution still exists, maybe not in physical form as it did for the Antioch Christians in, in our own lives, but in other ways. And there are so many things that God enables us to do for one another that, that helps to encourage one another. It, it might be something as simple as a, a smile on a Sunday morning when you see somebody walk in and you catch their eye. It might be a willingness to listen to somebody who says, do you have a minute? I've got I to talk about something. It might be a prayer that you say in private that only you and God know about, but that, according to James, is powerful and effective. God doesn't expect you to root up your family and move to a strange country and try to meet as many people as you can to share the word with him or with them, but he expects you to take the opportunities you have to show your Christianity, and that can happen all day, every day. The Lord will put you into situations where you can be a positive influence on others, where you can change the perception that might be negative about what a Christian is. How terrible it would be if somebody looking at our lives and hearing our words would say, well, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be one. But how wonderful wouldn't it be if someone says, tell me more about being a Christian. And that's what was happening in Antioch. That's what happened throughout the, the known world at that time as the persecution scattered people. And in all things, God worked for the good of those who loved him. The message continued to spread. There will be people today who still say, ah, you're a Christian. And they'll have a wrong perception of what a Christian is. You think you're better than everyone else. You think you're the only ones going to heaven. But we can change that perception simply by being Christians, by being little Christs, Christians, people who do what Christ did, people who took time to sit down and talk with others, people who listened when someone needed an ear, people who were encouraging when others were down, people who were humble in what they did, people who were servants and washed feet. We pray that God will continue to make us proud to be Christians and that we would wear that title proudly by what we say and do in our lives. And we pray for opportunities to be able to share that message so that others too may be led to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
that souls may be taken back from Satan and saved by Jesus for eternal life in heaven. God bless us as we live our lives as Christians now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God that goes beyond our understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our offering.